You know how we always talk about how Trump filed 65 lawsuits back in 2020 and only won one or like even a half of one? Well, this week he won another one, although uh, he more or less did it by kicking the ball into his own goal and then cheering for himself. Welcome to Law and Chaos. It's five days before the election, and it is all down to Pennsylvania. Well, maybe it's down to Pennsylvania in the voting, but when it comes to election litigation, the Keystone State is getting a big old head start. And did the Supreme Court's conservatives just tip their hand and show that they're totally willing to do whatever it takes to make Trump president again? We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Happy Friday, Chaos Monkeys. I'm Liz Dye. With me, as always, is Andrew Torres. Andrew, how are you? (laughs) I'm doing great, Liz. Did you have a happy Halloween? Uh, I did. There was quite a lot of uh, trick-or-treat action going on at my house. The dog Uh, was not happy, but but we're still good. We made it through. (laughs) Well, well, that's good. So up on the website, we have a piece by my son uh, about how to watch the six o'clock hour of the elections when the returns come in in Kentucky and Indiana. Joe came on and talked to you, Andrew, about it. Uh, And we got a lot of positive feedback on the show. So it's up in written form now. And I think that we're going to have him here again on the Tuesday show, because as you know, Tuesday is election day. And uh, it's the only thing you guys are thinking about. So (laughs) I think that there could be some crazy law news, in which case it will be maybe half the show. But um, but I think you're going to have you'll hear from Joe again soon. Yeah. Today, we will uh, also cover a bunch of election stories, as you might imagine. And we're going to start with the bad news, which is that the Supreme Court just greenlit the removal of actual legitimate voters from the rolls in Virginia in a blatant violation of the National Voter Registration Act. We talked about this case a lot. It's the one where Virginia's Governor Glenn Youngkin announced on the 90th day before the election, August 7th, that the state was purging non-citizens from the voter rolls based on a comparison of the state's list of voters and the list of people who got driver's licenses and checked the box at the DMV saying they were non-citizens, or they didn't check any box. They refused to check the box saying that they were citizens. Yeah. And Liz, one of the things that you've pointed out at considerable length is that that's a terrible metric for figuring out if somebody in 2024 is actually a citizen entitled to vote, right? Like, it's definitionally retrospective. So the person may have been a non-citizen at the time they got their license and then become a citizen since then. We naturalize people. I, I know Trump would rather we didn't, but like, that yeah, happens. Yeah. And, Except for his and, wives. Yeah, right. And look, These kinds of dragnets always sweep in people who, you know, have checked the wrong box by mistake or whatever, or even people who just have the misfortune of having similar last names to other people who show up as, you know, non-citizens. Like, and all of those things absolutely happened here as the civil plaintiffs attested to in their complaint in sworn affidavits. Right. And, you know, not to diminish that, but perhaps more to the point. This thing blatantly violates the NVRA. That's 52 U.S.C. 20507B2A, which says a state shall complete not later than 90 days prior to the date of a primary or general election for federal office any program, the purpose of which is to systematically remove the names of ineligible voters from the official list of eligible voters, which is why Youngkin made that big show of announcing it on the 90th day. He wanted to make it very clear that he was deliberately defying this law that was passed to ensure access to the ballot. Yeah, I thank God that guy leaves office next year. I mean, look, look, I love you, Virginia, but like, what were you doing? I mean, thank God that guy is going to leave office next year. And next year's weird, right? Like, I am super not in favor of off off year elections for a lot of reasons. And Virginia's ostensible reforms, right? Like the governor can't serve consecutive terms. Like the, those were, I think, terrible ideas. They haven't reduced corruption. But I gotta say, if the net effect of all of that is to send that walking fleece fest back to the private sector <laughs> and, you know, hand the reins over to Abigail Spanberger, like, sign me up, okay? Yunkin is just an absolute waste of space. And I cannot tell you how happy I am delighted that the Democrats took back both houses of the Virginia State Legislature this year. 
Yeah, 100 percent. So Youngkin announced this voter purge and ongoing policy. And he, you know, it gets promptly sued by a bunch of immigrant rights groups and the League mm-hmm. of Women Voters. And some of these people wrongfully booted off the rolls. You also get sued by the Justice Department, and the trial judge issues an injunction ordering Virginia to reinstate everyone who got tossed, and the judge says, go tell all those people that you already booted that they're back on the rolls. And the Fourth Circuit said, yes, yes, all that, please. And then Virginia appealed to the Supreme Court, and Wednesday morning, the six conservative justices stayed that injunction pending appeal, which is insane. So that action violates the plain meaning of the NVRA. Like, If this isn't a systemic voter purge, I don't know what is. Yeah. This is incredibly disturbing on every level. And particularly because, you know, we have an election on Tuesday. And uh, this strikes me. It struck you in your piece that you wrote it above the law that this is an overt sign by the Supreme Court's right wing howler monkey contingent that they will they are standing back and standing by to steal the election for Donald Trump yeah. if they can. Right. Like because this particular case is not close. The NVRA is black letter law. Right. And that's an area where the Constitution specifically says, like, you know, states get to set the time, place and manner of the choosing of their elections. But Congress can regulate it, which they did. Um, I think the best way that I can put this into context is the state of Alabama tried to do this exact same thing. And Judge Anna Manasco, a Trump appointee, blocked it on NVRA grounds. That was two weeks ago. And you know what? Alabama didn't even try to appeal, right? Like they didn't go to the 11th Circuit because they knew that they'd get stomped down once again. And for the Supreme Court to look at this case and in a case on the shadow docket, with affidavits that say, hey, I'm a citizen, I'm entitled to vote, and I got kicked off the rolls wrongfully in this indiscriminate purge, and still say, we're going to enjoin anything that would restore to you your right to vote as an American citizen is offensive, it's crazy, it's wrong, it's terrifying. If you're searching for a silver lining, I don't know, I would say this, that if you get to the polls, and your name is not on the voter rolls, register in person and vote provisional ballot under HAVA. We're going to talk about provisional ballots a lot on the show. Yeah. All right. So uh, that little dog's leg to Virginia was fun, but we are going to spend almost the entire rest of the show in Pennsylvania, where it's all going down. We will be a little bit in Texas, but we'll get to that. For now, let's go to our man on the ground in the Commonwealth. Oh, no. <laughs> We caught them cheating big in Pennsylvania. Must announce and prosecute now. This is a criminal violation of the law. Stop voter fraud. Check out Kamala's new sleazebag lawyer. We are on them all this time. Who would have ever thought that our country is so corrupt? Kamala's new sleazebag lawyer? No, 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 you I know don't what? even know that. Don't even tell me. What is that jackass on about? Wait for it. Wow, your county, Pennsylvania, received thousands of potentially fraudulent voter registration forms and mail-in ballot applications from a third-party group. This on top of Lancaster County being caught with 2,600 fake ballots and forms, all written by the same person. Really bad stuff. What is going on in Pennsylvania? Law enforcement must do their job immediately. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Okay, so it appears that some group of canvassers submitted a giant stack of voter registration, some of which were fake, others of which were real. Uh, I think that's what happened just from public reporting and from this press conference called by the Lancaster County prosecutors. The website, Lancaster Online, says that, quote, an investigation by the district attorney's office found incorrect addresses, false identification information, false names, and names that did not match Social Security information. I cannot vouch for Lancaster Online, particularly since there have been in the past few years a whole bunch of fake local news sites popping up. Uh, I, I will say that the top headline on the news site was, afraid a township man sentenced to probation over botched neutering of a dog. Right. And so, of course, you click through to the story. I, I did not. I, I, I got a retrue social man. I, I'm <laughs> Fair. Of, I don't have that much bandwidth left. Anyway, if these were fake names and social security numbers, like, no shit, they got picked up immediately by the registrar. That's actually proof that you cannot just register Mickey Mouse or like Mickey the undocumented mouse or whatever. Like, you can't register fake people to vote. I, yeah. So much to unpack in what you've said. First, I'm thinking about the Lancaster County 
DA's office announcing that they're inv- like, this is why the Department of Justice has that policy, you know, that we've talked about this at length, the 60 day rule before elections, right? Because federally, what you would not do is have your prosecutors announce an investigation into potential fraudulent ballots, you know, before actually conducting that investigation, making an arrest. And certainly you would do none of that the week before the election, where a lot of people already don't trust the process, right? Well, actually, I'm saying this, and as the words are coming out of my mouth, I'm remembering that Attorney General Bill Barr did exactly that with a story in Luzerne uh-huh. County, Pennsylvania, about supposed discarded military ballots that, by the way, turned out to be 100% bullshit. Uh, anyway, what these local prosecutors have done here, maybe deliberately, we don't know, is feed a storyline about election insecurity when what happens Liz, as you just documented, proves the opposite, right? Like it's when Republicans point to fentanyl that gets seized at the southern border as evidence that the country is, you know, awash in Mexican drugs, right? Like that, that makes no damn sense. Like they caught these fake registrations because they were obviously fake. That seems to me anyway, to confirm that there are not hordes of ineligible voters clogging up the rolls. Yeah, and not for nothing, but last week we read in The Guardian that canvassers hired by Elon Musk to door knock in Arizona for Donald Trump, that, that the door knockers were spoofing their locations mm-hmm. in the tracking apps. And Wired actually had a story yesterday about Musk's America Pack shipping door knockers out to rural Michigan in the back of a U-Haul and telling them if they didn't meet their targets, they'd have to pay for their own hotel and flights home. So like... If any campaign is pressuring canvassers to come up with fake voter registration, uh, let's say that Harris campaign would not be my first suspect. (laughs) Yeah. But okay, we have a million items from Pennsylvania today. So put a pin in the world's most thin-skinned billionaire for a hot second. And let's talk about two cases working their way through the courts that have to do with botched mail-in ballots, Mm -hmm. which is a thing that happens a lot in Pennsylvania. So the first involves missing security envelopes. We talked about this ruling from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court saying that people who forgot to put the inner security envelope in and had their ballots discarded could just vote provisionally in person. Mm -hmm. So the RNC took the position and, and the Trump campaign that people who screw up their ballots shouldn't be able to get them counted under any circumstances. So they appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court to stay the Pennsylvania court's ruling or at least to segregate the provisional ballots cast by people whose mail-in ballots were discarded because they were defective or whatever. And we've talked a lot about the independent state legislature theory on this show. That's the idea that the Constitution bars state courts from ruling on issues of election law because election law is the unique province of the legislators. That's, that's the basis for the RNC and the Trump campaign's petition for stay at the Supreme Court and the petition for certiorari. They also argue that the ruling was wrong as a matter of Pennsylvania law. So the responses from the state were due yesterday, and we have not yet heard from the Supreme Court. I think that there is an even chance that today, Friday, as you're listening to this, the Supreme Court will order the segregation of those provisional ballots, which, as we've said, that that's the goal here for Republicans. Ensure that there are a pile of ballots they can treat like poker chips after everything else is counted and try and like rerun the, you know, the stop the count Bush v. Gore play. Although I should note that the state defendants made a pretty strong argument that the RNC waived any federal claims by failing to assert them in state court. Yeah, I I am wondering how the RNC can claim that the state court never had jurisdiction and simultaneously advance this independent state legislature theory, right? Like, because didn't it actively join the case as an intervener in the trial court and then actively prosecuted the appeals, right? And and I guess we're supposed to think that uh, they forgot to mention that they thought that the state court lacked jurisdiction over the case. Like, I think that ship has sailed. I, you know, I, I hope anyway. I think so too, but God knows what Sam Alito thinks. Anyway, we're keeping an eye on this one because, uh, you know, if Pennsylvania is close, these provisional ballots could wind up being very important, along with the pile of mail-in ballots that are in dispute in the second case that we're going to talk about. So um, we'll be right back after this brief ad break, unless, as you know, you are a subscriber at patreon.com slash lawandchaospod or at lawandchaospod.com, in which case, nope, no ads for you.
And we're back. Okay. So as you had did before the break, Liz, I want to talk about an election decision that just got handed down. It, it's an intermediate appellate court case from Pennsylvania. It is captioned Baxter v. Philadelphia Board of Elections. And it's potentially significant in a very good way if, as we're concerned, that Pennsylvania starts looking like the 2000 Florida of, of this election. Right. So we talked about how Pennsylvania Republicans in the legislature passed a bunch of laws that are designed to basically make lawful mail-in ballots so complicated that it trips up a lot of people, and then they get their ballots tossed on basically technicalities. So one of those laws requires the local election board to throw out ballots that have both envelopes, the outer envelope and the inner security envelope, and are signed But like the voter either writes the wrong date on the dateline or leaves that dateline blank. And then like, whatever, everyone agrees that the date you put on the line is, I mean, as the court put it, meaningless. So um, here's what that court said. Multiple state and federal courts have determined that the dating provisions are meaningless as they do not establish voter eligibility, timely ballot receipt or fraud. This is illustrated by the fact that a voter whose ballot was timely received could have signed the declaration form only in between the date the county board sent the mail ballot package and the election day deadline, and ballots received after 8 p.m. on election day are not counted regardless of the handwritten date. Mm -hmm. Enforcement of the dating provisions has resulted in the arbitrary and baseless rejection of thousands of timely ballots, resulting in disenfranchisement in violation of the Free and Equal Elections Clause of the Pennsylvania Constitution. Yeah. That's Article 1, Section 5 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. And and we've talked about this before, right? You have the Federal Bill of Rights, but states are perfectly free, and and all of them do provide constitutional rights that apply to all the citizens of their states that go beyond the rights enshrined in the Federal Constitution. And here, Pennsylvania chose to protect the right to vote. So this elections clause says, quote, elections shall be free and equal and no power, civil or military, shall at any time interfere to prevent the free exercise of the right of suffrage. So this is a classic legal argument as to whether the specific law here, which again is also equally clear, right? It says if the date's wrong, you got to throw it out. If that law violates the general principle that's enshrined as a fundamental right for everyone to vote in the Pennsylvania state constitution. Right. So this was a challenge brought by 69 voters in a September special election, and these voters' mail-in ballots were rejected because of inaccurate or blank datelines. And the Philadelphia County Elections Board applied the law as written and refused to count those ballots, and the trial court reversed. So yesterday, the Pennsylvania Appellate Court affirmed that reversal holding that we cannot countenance any law governing elections that has the practical effect of impermissibly infringing on certain individuals' fundamental right to vote, which is pervasive of other basic civil and political rights relative to that of other voters who may be able to exercise the franchise more easily in light of the free and equal elections clause's prescription, guaranteeing all citizens an equal right on par with every other citizen to elect their representative. To look at a mail ballot that substantially follows the requirements of the election code, save for including a handwritten date on the outer envelope declaration, and which also includes a timestamp date indicating its timely receipt by the voters' respective county board of elections by 8 p.m. on election day, and say that such voter is not entitled to vote for whomever candidates he or she has chosen therein due to a minor irregularity thereon, is to negate the whole genius of our electoral machinery. So essentially... They're saying because this dating on the envelope law serves no actual state interest, it violates equal protection to toss out some otherwise valid votes on a technicality. And that means which, well, at least for now, the county elections boards will be required to count those badly dated or undated mail-in votes on Pennsylvania on Tuesday night. Yeah. And we've heard that that affects thousands of ballots. And I know some of the listeners have seized on your, at least for now, language, Liz, and they're probably rightfully a little bit nervous, but uh, mm-hmm. but I agree with you. And I think that, you know, the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has handed down pro-democracy rulings as of late. We've discussed that on the show. Right. Well, it, it did flip in 2023, right? Yeah. It, right. It, it was 4-3 uh, one direction. Now it's 4-3 our direction. Yeah. 
But before we leave this story, I want to highlight a thoroughly disingenuous dissent from one of the judges on the panel at the Intermediate mm-hmm. Appellate Court, right? Because it really illustrates the point that we want to make on the show. You've said it once already, and that is if on Tuesday you are given the chance to cast a provisional ballot, cast it, right? So, okay, let's talk about the dissent. Judge Matthew S. Wolf thinks that this decision runs afoul of the Purcell principle that I have railed about at some length on this show. Because remember, Purcell, that's the Supreme Court decision that that says essentially don't change the rules too close to an election. And like, look, Liz, you and I agree that in the abstract, that that principle makes some sense, right? Mm -hmm. The, The problem is, is that the Supreme Court has applied it ridiculously unevenly, such as making people vote in congressional districts that everyone agrees are racially gerrymandered that violate the law because it's, you know, within a year of the election. Like that. Okay. So Judge Wolf thinks that this decision could confuse potential Pennsylvania voters and possibly disenfranchise them. And this, this rationale must be heard to be believed. So he says, This court's last-minute decision calls into question voters need to vote by provisional ballot if they suspect an issue with the date on their mail-in or absentee ballot. When word of the Baxter decision gets out, and there he's referring (laughs) to the majority opinion, right? It may lead an elector or election official to believe that an undated or incorrectly dated ballot will be counted, despite its defect, counseling away from appearing on election day to vote provisionally. And this may stand true. But this court, an intermediate appellate court, will most likely not be the last to speak on the issue. And the timing of this intermediate appellate court's decision puts the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in a near impossible position. The majority opinion will undoubtedly influence the behavior of voters and election officials across the Commonwealth and will do so in a time frame that all but forecloses further appellate review from our high court. So, do you see the slippage here? (laughs) I do. Yeah, I know you do. But look, Judge Wolf is dissenting from an opinion saying that your vote will count despite the defect. And now he's worried that if the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in the next few days takes this case, and then if they reverse, if they adopt the position he's arguing for, right, and reverse the intermediate appellate court, that will wind up confusing people who only heard about the appellate court case, but not the reversal by the Supreme Court, and that those voters might decide not to cast a provisional ballot because they mistakenly think that their ballot will count, even though they've now been reversed. Uh. And that and that could disenfranchise them. And, and you're reading this, and literally, like, well, you know, if you're worried about disenfranchising voters, one good way to solve that is not disenfranchise them in the first place, which is what the majority wanted to do. And by the way, it's what this judge wants to do. He wants to disenfranchise them. Yes. To be clear. Right. So let's be charitable here. Uh, perhaps Judge Wolf misunderstands how provisional ballots go uh, because, <laughs> you know, absolutely anyone who cast a mail in ballot anywhere who thinks there's a reason that it might get thrown out should also go in person on Election Day and cast a provisional ballot. I mean, don't take legal advice from a podcast, but like, the officials have to let you cast a provisional ballot under the 2002 Help America Vote Act. And it's not a risk. To, like if your earlier vote is valid, the provisional ballot won't be counted. If there's a problem with it for some reason, it will be counted. This is not voter fraud. It doesn't double count a ballot. It's not election interference. It is designed to protect your right to vote. So like vote your provisional ballot if you're if it's offered, if you're worried about it. And especially like in Pennsylvania, where they're going to send you an email that says, there's something defective with your ballot. You can come in and cure it or you can go vote provisionally. All right. Here. <laughs> we will be right back after this brief ad break unless, well, you know the drill. And we're back. Okay. For a bit of a palate cleanser here, we we received a question from one of our favorite patron names, uh, DCI Vera Stanhope, uh, on social media. She asks, in the latest episode, you made a comment that I've heard many times. That is, if Trump is elected, the federal cases, criminal cases against him go away because he'll fire Jack Smith. Do judges have the ability to refuse to dismiss a case? Oh, you have come to the right place, Inspector. (laughs) 
And as it turns out, I filed an amicus brief on this very issue. And you may or may not recall when Donald Trump's corrupt attorney general, Bill Barr, ordered his line prosecutors to dismiss the criminal charges against Trump crony Michael Flynn, even though Flynn had pled guilty, gotten a sweetheart deal, agreed to that plea bargain, reaffirmed his agreement twice under oath in open court. uh, And, you know, Bill Barr said, no, 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 we have to dismiss this case anyway, because Sidney Powell wanted it to. And all credit to the line prosecutors who, as one, refused to do so, resigned from the case and said, no, we're not we're not going to be a party to this. And then, of course, Bill Barr uh, just appointed a guy who was willing to play ball to take over. Uh, Judge Emmett Sullivan, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, smelled something funny, and he was skeptical that he had to be party to this sort of uh, apparent corruption. And then I wrote a brief, and and, and I want to say I got tremendous help uh, from my former associate and from an intern, they both did amazing work. Like I'm not, I am not trying to take credit. I could not have done it without without their help. Uh, it was essential. But that brief argued that yes, Judge Sullivan could use his discretion and refuse to dismiss the case. The operative rule is Rule 48A of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, and it says this: It says the government may, with leave of court, dismiss an indictment, information, or complaint. The government may not dismiss the prosecution during trial without the defendant's consent. And that bit about the defendant's consent is really meant to prevent serial harassment of of targets, right? Like the government filing charges, taking it all the way to trial, dropping the charges at trial, and then, you know, indicting you again and kind of, and obviously that's Mm -hmm. not at all what we're talking about here. But that ambiguity left open the question of what leave of court means when both the government and the defendant do consent to the dismissal, because turns out that's an open question. Now, I I say open in that there's there's no dispositive D.C. Circuit case on or or Supreme Court case on the issue. But like, obviously, I think the much better argument is that the court could use its discretion in the interests of justice and and refuse to dismiss if it thinks something's up. But okay, Um, you're thinking, all right, suppose Judge Tanya Chutkin, right? Uh, uh, Judge Sullivan's colleague buys that same argument, just refuses to dismiss the case under Rule 48. Couldn't she do that? Couldn't that keep the the prosecution against Trump intact? Um, No. And there are at least four reasons here. And I'm I'm sorry to have to, you know, say that, but like, you know, this is (laughs) this is the law, right? First, factually, the reason that we could write that brief in the Flynn case is that there was a plea deal already in place, right? He'd already mm-hmm. pled guilty. There wasn't a crime left to prosecute. Here there is, right? And so think about how this would work, right? Like Jack Smith would have to make an official referral on his way out to a U.S. attorney. And then, thanks to the Supreme Court, Donald Trump could just fire that guy, right? Or Whoever, you know, Trump puts in as attorney general could then say, oh, uh, we're going to reassign this to an AUSA that we uh, have handpicked, who's then going to, you know, prosecute the case incompetently or drop it or whatever. Okay, that's kind of. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Under the independent counsel statute, which expired. The president could not fire. Am I correct? Yeah. Right. There were there were Clinton couldn't fire Ken Starr. Right. Right. I, I, that's what I thought. Right. Bill Clinton couldn't fire Ken Starr, who was, you know, and, and we all remember what happened there. But Ken Starr was so widely abusive that we allowed the independent counsel statute to lapse. And so now we just have special counsels and special counsels can be fired. Now, that's a norm that that presidents haven't fired them. But Donald Trump doesn't give a shit about norms. And he has said that he will fire Jack Smith uh, on inauguration day if indeed he gets another term. Yeah. and. There are other principles that come into play here, even if you think there is some way to put guardrails up, which there are not, and all of them favor Trump. So let's sort of briefly go through them. Point number two is that sitting presidents are now, I I think, formally immune from criminal prosecution while they are the president. This has never been adjudicated by a court of competent jurisdiction. Uh, It was not exactly a settled proposition of law, but you know, it, it does make sense, right? And the Supreme Court's Trump v. U.S. immunity decision 
kind of makes this clear where the court is. This is uh, this is footnote two. It says in the criminal context, the Justice Department has long recognized that the separation of powers precludes the criminal prosecution of a sitting president. And then there's a citation to an Office of Legal Counsel memorandum. Now, again, OLC memoranda are not law, but Mm -hmm. look like this is where the court is. I'm not sure there's there are any votes on the Supreme Court for you can indict a sitting president. And like there are reasons for me to think that, you know, you, you probably ought not to be able to. You, you should have to stay that until they get out of office. Mm-hmm. But thanks to the Supreme Court's immunity decision, you can now overtly direct the attorney general to drop the case against you for political reasons. And nobody can ever second guess that opinion. Nobody can ever second guess that question. And, and then finally, and I hope that I never have to do a deep dive on this issue. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. But I believe, and, and I think this is actually not even that close of a call. I, I think that Donald Trump or any president can pardon himself. I, I acknowledge that there are scholars who disagree. I mean, isn't that one of the ones that's also settled by the Trump v. U.S. decision, right? If, if they've said that the exercise of the president's core powers, including, as they said, pardon, it is not questionable, can't be questioned in any court of law or anywhere else, well, then Trump pardoning himself would be an exercise of core powers and can't be questioned anymore. I mean, I think, and look, let's be clear, the law is in this area, whatever the Supreme Court says, it is. And the Supreme Court has said it's not going to tolerate prosecuting Trump, as far as I can tell. So, I mean, I think that's the that's the end of the story here. I don't want to lose sight. I, I, I agree with the second half of what you've said. Sadly, I think the right wing of the Supreme Court mm-hmm. has, you know, shown their whole ass in this matter. But uh, but I don't want to lose sight of, of that first half, which I think is really, really smart insight. It's not one that I thought about. And that is that you would not have standing to bring a case. If Donald Trump says, I'm pardoning myself, right? And a prosecutor says, yeah, we don't think that's valid, right? I I can't envision a vehicle now that is compatible with U.S. v. Trump in which you could, you know, go to a court and get a writ of mandamus or whatever, right? Like there's no way Mm -hmm. to do that. That wouldn't involve a court doing the thing that John Roberts now says courts can't do because the power to pardon is one of the enumerated core powers of the president, right, set forth in Article 2. And John Roberts has said anything that falls into that bucket is absolutely immune, right? And, you know, we we have the SEAL Team 6 problem, but, you know, like, there are a lot of things that the Supreme Court was not troubled about as a consequence of its immunity decision. So, Vera, I don't relish having to answer the question this way. Uh, but one of the things we try and do on the show is to tell you who is and who is not necessarily going to ride to the rescue. And, you know, I think if you want to hold Donald Trump legally accountable for trying to steal the election in 2020 and trying to overthrow democracy in this country, I think the only thing you can do is vote for Kamala Harris. So uh, make sure you do that. Yeah. Amen to that. Uh, I don't I mean, look, I for a long time thought like, oh, you know, Robert Mueller will save us or Jack Smith will save us or. Well, I didn't think that about Smith because I lived through the first Trump administration (laughs) and I knew no one was riding to the rescue, but no one's riding to the rescue but us. So uh, let's be sure to rescue ourselves on Tuesday. Okay, that was depressing. So uh, let's take a little trip in the Wayback Machine to last month when Vice President Harris did that interview with 60 Minutes. Uh, the Law and Chaos media reporter, not impressed. Not impressed, man. <laughs> oh, All right. With me, 60 Minutes does the exact opposite. They take everything I say, realize how totally brilliant it is, and take it out. So with Kamala, they add. With Trump, they delete. Like the Democrat Party, they are a threat to democracy. 60 Minutes is a major part of the news organization of CBS, which has just created the greatest fraud in broadcast history. CBS should lose its license and it should be bid out to the highest bidder, as should all other broadcast licenses, because they are just as corrupt as CBS and maybe even worse. Uh, Good times. Remember that one, Andrew? Oh, do I. And yet, five days before the election, Donald Trump has found lawyers willing to file a lawsuit suing CBS for airing that episode of 60 Minutes. Okay. Since you start with the lawyers, let's do that. All right. Let's start with the lawyers because one of Trump's lawyers on this document is a guy named Daniel Epstein. He he worked in various positions in the Trump administration. I think Trump nominated him for a couple of things and he was 
kind of ignored by the Senate. But he was the one who last month said that announced that Trump was going to file a hundred million (laughs) dollar lawsuit against the Justice (laughs) Department for uh, violating his civil rights in the Mar-a-Lago raid for like abuse of process or abuse of authority or some other bullshit thing. So he filed this because the Federal Tort Claims Act says when you are going to sue the government, you have to give them some time. You have to like register your claim and say like, this is what is wrong. I would like you to make it right. And you have to give them time to make it right. But the problem is that as we've talked about sovereign immunity, the the federal government has to tell you what you can sue it for. And like, you were mean to me and, you know, you executed a judicially authorized warrant at my house is not one of those things. And also, it you know, he, he went on TV, he Epstein went on TV and talked about the punitive damages he was going to collect. And like, no, dude, there's no punitive <laughs> damages under the federal <laughs> tort claims. Like the, the, the statute that he's purporting to sue under is for like, if the mailman sideswipes your car and like, you know, you can sue for that kind of tort, it, this is not. Yeah. So uh, that that's the lawyer on this case, just just to get us started here. Second, I think you kind of might have buried the lead here, which is that Trump didn't just file a lawsuit. He filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas, the Amarillo Division, so as to get assigned to his own appointee, Judge Matthew Ketch Merrick whom we've talked about a lot on the show. And, you know, look, he's never met a right wing conspiracy theory he doesn't love. You guys may remember him. He is the judge who uh, enjoined or kind of retroactively invalidated the FDA authorization of Mifepristone, the medication abortion drug, because something, 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 because it made doctors who don't prescribe Mifepristone sad is functionally the, the theory of standing that he entertained. He is a loon. And uh, I mean, I don't I don't even know. I, I, I don't even know how he could stand this case. I, I don't want to be overly optimistic, but like I cannot imagine any sitting judge <laughs> allowing this to go forward. But, you know, we'll we'll find out. And look, if you're looking for a silver lining and I know I'm, I'm grasping at straws here. Right. It is that this continues to highlight an issue that. Liz, you and I are super geeky about, but I'd like to see it proliferate into the public consciousness, right? And that is these single member districts, right? In which you can file in the Amarillo division and you know you're going to get catch Merrick. And Mm -hmm. Congress under a Harris administration could do something about that. Yeah. So just to kind of encapsulate this argument, the Judicial Conference, which is presided over by Chief Justice John Roberts, has said, we don't think it is healthy for there to be these these forums, these single judge districts where where you can essentially forum shop and get the judge that you want. And the other federal circuits were like, yes, this is bad. We do not agree with this either, because everybody knew that it was directed at the Fifth Circuit, where they've got places like Catch Merrick and, and we've got Reed O'Connor and Mark Pittman in another one of these districts that are basically one stop shops. And they're the ones producing all of these nationwide injunctions about against basically everything that the Biden administration does. And so the Fifth Circuit said, no, we're not going to do that. We're gonna, we, we like our forum shopping, TYVM, and basically put up two big middle fingers. Yeah. OK, so maybe we'll make some progress on that under a Harris administration. For now, let's laugh at this dumb lawsuit. Because apparently this lawyer talked Trump out of suing CBS to revoke its non-existent broadcast license. So plus one point for him. Uh, But then Uh talked him into filing a lawsuit alleging that airing that episode of 60 Minutes constituted a deceptive trade practice under the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Consumer Protection Act. Yeah. I mean, just to be clear, this is a law that's like if your granny opens the door to a traveling salesman who says he's going to fix her roof with like, you know, high grade shingles or whatever. And he, you know, just like puts cardboard up there. That's what the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Mm -hmm. Act is for. It doesn't exist for like stuff people said on national television broadcasts. I mean, it's absolutely an inappropriate use of this of this statute. So, for instance, how is Trump a consumer? I mean, Trump, who 
by the way, is a Florida resident. How is he a consumer anywhere but even in the state of Texas? Uh, Here's how it is. President Trump is a consumer within the meaning of the Deceptive Trade Practices Act since he is an individual who sought and received CBS's broadcast services. Moreover, as the leading presidential candidate, Donald Trump will be evaluated by the Texas electorate and the electorate in all states on November 5th, 2024. As such, President Trump stands in the shoes of each Texas voter entitled to the honest (laughs) services expected from CBS-owned and affiliated television stations in Texas. I I, I don't know what the hell that means. I mean, nothing. It means nothing. Yeah, all of that is nonsense. But again, from a practitioner standpoint, this tells me that the lawyers who filed this either didn't bother to read the actual law or did or did and didn't care what it said, right? Because mm-hmm. one of the things you do when you approach this is you say, oh, I'm going to sue under the Deceptive Trade Practices Act. It says it can be brought by a consumer. Does the law define consumer? And shockingly, this law does define consumer. That's section 17.45 of the Texas Business and Commerce Code. And it says consumer means an individual partnership corporation, this state or a subdivision or agency of the state who seeks or acquires by purchase or lease any goods or services, except that the term does not include a business consumer that has assets of $25 million or more, or that is owned or controlled by a corporation or entity with assets of $25 million or more. Yeah, I I mean, Donald Trump is suing in his individual capacity here, and maybe maybe he has more than twenty five million dollars. Maybe he doesn't. But since he purports to be suing also for every consumer in the state of Texas (laughs) and indeed nationwide, but not the Trump campaign. Note that he doesn't say the Trump campaign because the Trump campaign definitely has more than twenty five million dollars. Yeah. And again, this highlights the point that you were making, which is This is a consumer protection statute. And the reason for that carve out is, look, if you're a super wealthy guy, like you don't need to be protected against the predatory terms on the back of that credit card or the traveling salesman. Right. right? Like that's why Mm -hmm. you are excluded from the class of plaintiffs that this is meant to protect. And I have to add, in addition to all of that, the act defines services, right? It says any goods or services. There's not a good here. Trump is saying the broadcast of 60 Minutes is a service, except the act defines services as, quote, work, labor, or service purchased or leased for use, including services furnished in connection with the sale or repair of goods, which again, purchased or leased, does not seem to include watching free network television. Yeah, so you're saying this is not a meritorious lawsuit? Well, what I'm saying is that I definitely regret reading it backwards, as if it were. Um, and. I don't know. Try this one on for size. I'm I'm trying to be optimistic today. Like, I don't think campaigns that think they're about to win the presidency next week do this sort of thing five days before the election. I mean, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not with you on that one, because I think Donald Trump just sues like breathing. Like we're talking about somebody who sued Hillary Clinton and James Comey and Rod Rosenstein, his own deputy <sighs> AG for doing a RICO to him, for which they got a million dollar civil fine because it was such a garbage goddamn lawsuit. And like, as a person who reads his lawsuits, it was an Alina Hobba joint. And she also was jointly and severally liable for that million dollar fine. And so I do not think that Donald Trump, like, I don't think you can make any conclusion about his state of mind or expectations about next week from the fact that he files a garbage lawsuit. He files garbage lawsuits all the goddamn time withdrawn counselor. (laughs) All right. So before we go, I would like to tell you that Donald Trump is seeking $10 billion in damages with a B because, (laughs) quote, CBS's distortion of the 60 Minutes interview damaged President Trump's fundraising and support values by several billions of dollars, particularly in Texas. And uh, I'd just like to point out that Donald Trump's entire campaign, including all of his PACs, has raised just over a billion dollars in all of 2024. So I'm not sure about the suggestion <laughs> that uh, there's uh, like one interview a month ago depressed his fundraising by several billion dollars, particularly in Texas. You know, in addition to the humor value, the one thing that made me not want to chew my arm off having read this complaint is that at least it now specifies 
the thing that they think CBS, you know, the producers of 60 Minutes did. And it is bonkers, right? Like there are 70 different paragraphs that are like, they took her word salad answer and, you know, made it look like she was smart. Or whatever. And when they actually describe what they claim was cut out versus what was put in, it was like they claim. And I, again, you know, hold on to your seat here. They claim that 60 Minutes cut a nuanced answer about Israel and replaced it with a more definitive. So what we're going to do is try and end the conflict in Gaza as soon as possible, which like, how is that? I, 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 I'm just at a loss. Uh, also, they referred to Vice President Harris as Kamala, just used her first name throughout, did not refer to her as Vice President Harris. Like Trump, yeah. who is not the president, is always referred to as President Trump. She's referred to by her first name, like it's gross and sexist and whatever. So it's, it's not like they even referred to Biden, you know, as Joe. Like, yeah, no, uh, that's a good point. Crazy. All right. OK, we will be right back after this brief ad break. And maybe you would like to take this time to leave us a five star review on your favorite podcasting app. Just saying. Just saying. All right. One sec. Be right back, guys. Okay, you know how we always talk about how Trump filed 65 lawsuits back in 2020 and only won one or like even a half of one? Well, this week he won another one, although uh, he more or less did it by kicking the ball into his own goal and then cheering for himself. Let's, uh, let's set the scene, shall we? On Tuesday, a Republican elector named Valerie Biancaniello got herself arrested inside a municipal building in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, for harassing people who are standing in line to vote. Now, Pennsylvania does not have early voting. What it has is no excuse absentee voting, which they, I guess they allow you to come into the election office, request and fill out your absentee ballot, and then sort of cast it then and there instead of mailing it. Liz, I love hairline distinctions more than anyone on the planet. But like, can you make that make sense to me? Like, it takes 90 seconds to vote on a voting machine. And so what you're telling me is that instead of just letting people do that for some period before Election Day, Pennsylvania makes you stand in line, interface with a clerk, fill out this form and then fill out this absentee ballot and then wait for it to be tabulated in front of you. Like, how? I I don't know. To be fair, I think you can. My understanding is you can take this form and mail it or you could put it in a drop box. It's Mm -hmm. just that Trump has scared the shit out of his supporters by telling them that mail in votes are fraudulent and ballot boxes are fraudulent and only only in-person voting will do. Anyway, so this woman, Bianca Yellow, goes on Twitter with RNC chair Michael Watley and says this is how they suppress Republican votes. And like, Girl, no. Biden got 63 percent of the vote in Delaware County. Like if voters are standing in long lines there, it's not because Democrats are trying to stick it to the GOP. So anyway, the next day, Wednesday, the 30th, is the last day under the statute to register for an absentee ballot. And the lines are like way out the door in some Mm -hmm. places because, you know, as you said, takes a long time to have this whole, you know, fill out the form and have a conversation with the clerk and prove your identity and blah, blah, blah. So at 2.30, the clerks say, Everyone who's currently in line gets to register and vote, you know, cast their absentee ballot that day. But if you arrive after 2.30, you know, between 2.30 and 5, you only can register for the absentee ballot. You don't get to cast it. You know, you don't get to vote that day. Mm -hmm. And so the RNC and the Trump campaign see this item on the news and they file a lawsuit in Bucks County Court of Common Pleas demanding an injunction to allow two more days of absentee in-person I don't know, bullshit hybrid voting or whatever it's called. <laughs> and they got their injunction. I, wait, 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 a, wait a minute. You're telling me that the party that insisted that 2020 was rigged and stolen because judges made it easier to register to vote and cast their ballot went into a court and demanded that a judge make it easier for people to register to vote and cast their ballot? In violation of the actual statute. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fainting. I don't. Okay, like, oh, no, Mr. Trump, please don't expand early voting like the Democrats would definitely hate that. You you think my reverse psychology is going to work here? Look, okay. (laughs) in all seriousness, like. Even when he's right, like this is still I, I mean, like, 
it's not fair to Pennsylvania election workers who, you know, have an awful lot to do before next week to get ready. Like I did, you know, they have a lot on their plates. And, and you know, that hanging over all of that is the threat of more violence from Trump supporters. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. But Trump and the RNC are still out there bragging about their great victory. Huh? They got more early in-person voting. Look, I mean, I'm old. I walk down to the church and vote in the basement like I have for 20 years because, I mean, I always have, and it's it's a nice neighborhood activity and whatever. But I think that letting people vote early is absolutely a good value. Mm-hmm. And certainly, you know, if the RNC is uh, is into it now, cool, let, let, let's go. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's just the, you know, kind of changing the rules the week before yeah. the election. I, you know, I, but hey, as you point out, you know, good on them. Glad to see that happen. And speaking of uh, sort of, we have an update uh, finally on the saga of Elon Musk's voter registration lottery. In episode 76, we told you that this scheme to get at voter registration in swing states like probably was not actionable as vote buying, despite, mm-hmm. you know, there's some Voices that says that in episode 78, we came back and said that the civil suit brought by Philadelphia District Attorney Lawrence Krasner, asserting that Musk was operating an illegal lottery, right, that violated Pennsylvania state law, was much more promising. Yeah. And so Krasner didn't file a criminal complaint. He filed a civil complaint seeking injunctive relief. And so essentially, he wants a court to order Musk to knock off this illegal lottery like right now. And that hearing was scheduled at 10 a.m. on Thursday, October 31st, Halloween. That's today as we're recording it. The presiding judge, Angelo Foglietta, also ordered Musk to appear in person at that hearing since, you know, mm-hmm. he's the defendant in this civil suit. But just before midnight on Wednesday, October 30th, Musk's legal team removed the complaint to federal court. Yeah. And let me just, as a practitioner, I want to talk about the mechanics here for a second, because Mm -hmm. it it might not otherwise be clear, right? When you have a civil case, the filing of a notice of removal, right, automatically opens a federal case. That statute is 28 USC section 1441. And anybody who's ever practiced in federal court knows that statute, right? And When that happens, when a defendant removes the case to federal court, the burden then shifts back to the plaintiff, to the party opposing removal, to move to remand the case back to state court. And and the federal court gets to decide whether that's meritorious or not, right? So what that means is, right, they race to do this midnight the night before. So 10 a.m. the next morning, when the state court hearing rolls around in Judge Folietta's court, Elon Musk didn't even bother to show up. He was ordered to be there. He knew he could blow them off because the state court, as expected, no longer has jurisdiction over this matter, right? And so what they're going to do is, and, and what they did do was stay the state court proceedings and then let the federal court figure out whether it's going to retain jurisdiction over the case or remand it back down to Judge Foliette. Right, which is why a few hours later, D.A. Krasner filed an emergency motion in federal court to remand the case back to Judge Folietta, arguing that the removal was, quote, a stunt to obtain a procedural advantage to avoid a ruling on the preliminary injunction and run the clock until Election Day, which it was, mm-hmm. to be clear. So Musk's removal petition asserts two grounds for uh, for being in federal court for federal jurisdiction. First, he argues that the complaint filed by D.A. Krasner implicates federal issues because it's really about whether he's engaged in vote buying or not. And second, he argues that there's diversity jurisdiction because the district attorney is a citizen of the state of Pennsylvania, where Musk lives in Texas and his America PAC was organized there. And the amount in controversy is at least $75,000 because civil penalties would exceed that amount. Okay, so none of that is real law. And again, we use that phrase precisely here on the show. So let's talk about the diversity argument first. D.A. Krasner's lawsuit only seeks injunctive relief, as you pointed out, Liz. It does Mm -hmm. not request any civil penalties. It does not request disgorgement, right? So like the damages calculation is just wrong. He doesn't seek any money. But more importantly, The Supreme Court has made it clear, right? Diversity says all the parties have to be from different states, right? And the Supreme Court has made it clear since a 1973 decision called Moore versus County of Alameda 
that when a lawsuit is brought on behalf of a state, which is what you have here, the state isn't considered a citizen for purposes of removal under 28 U.S.C. 1441. So, no, right? Like, there isn't diversity of citizenship. It's not brought by a citizen. In his removal petition, Musk's lawyers said that Krasner is acting as a private citizen, not bringing the lawsuit on behalf of the state of Pennsylvania, because this is a civil suit, right, and not a a criminal indictment. And if that seems a little weird, (laughs) I should say, in support of that curious proposition, the lawyers cite to a single case called Krasner versus Attorney General, that is an intermediate Pennsylvania appellate court decision. And now, if you're one of our lawyer Mm -hmm. listeners, yeah, alarm bells should be going off because that definitely seems like it's the wrong court, right? And let me explain what I mean by that, right? Because if there is really a case that holds that the district attorney is a citizen for diversity purposes in civil lawsuits, you would expect that to be in a case where the defendant then removed to federal court and the federal right. court upheld that removal, which would mean it would be issued by a federal court, right? It would be a district court opinion or a third circuit opinion, or it's possible, right? That the the other alternative would be that federal court might say, hey, this is an unsettled question. We are going to certify a question to the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court and then get their answer. And then, so you might have this decision come from the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. But Whichever track it goes down, the one thing you could be confident it almost certainly would not have been would be an intermediate state appellate court decision, because the only way in which you get there is if the trial goes forward in state court, which means that the district court has already said, no, not a citizen. Yeah. Yeah, I I just I can't get my mind around Krasner acting in his position as the, you know, representative of the city of Philadelphia. He's like the Philadelphia district attorney. And then Musk turning around and removing and accusing Krasner of acting in his personal individual capacity. And it reminds me of this time when Donald Trump sued New York Attorney General Letitia James, <laughs> right? Crazy people. Like this, these are things good crazy people do. Trump sued New York Attorney General Letitia James in her theoretical personal capacity. And he sued her in state court in Palm Beach to stop her from moving the New York State Supreme Court to interfere with one of his trusts that was held in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And of course, like that was ridiculous. She wasn't getting sued in her personal capacity. And in her official capacity, she immediately removed the case to federal court where it landed on on the docket of Judge Donald Middlebrooks, who, you know, you and I were talking a minute ago about the the Hillary Clinton RICO suit. Judge Donald Middlebrooks was the one who assessed that million dollar fine and read Trump and his lawyers for filth. So like five seconds after that case against uh, the attorney general landed on Judge Middlebrooks's docket, Trump dismissed it. But like, <laughs> no, like state prosecutors don't act in a personal capacity. That doesn't make any goddamn sense. Yeah. And as it turns out, when you pull up the case that they cite, right, that Krasner v. Attorney General decision uh, uses the word citizen zero times. I, I control left it, right? It uses the word removal zero times. It uses right. the word remand zero times. Right? The, the decision, I, you know, I'm not even going to summarize the case here because it literally has nothing to do with federal jurisdiction, right? Like it, it's like mm-hmm. Musk's lawyers just sort of picked it out of a hat and attached it as a citation to a proposition for which it does not stand. Like it's like chat GPT generated this argument. Um, <laughs> I, I will. For the for the seven of you who will do this, I will link the case in the show notes, uh, and you know you're free to go read it yourselves. But uh, yeah, no, it's 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 crazy. It, it, it's a funny one. Like, there's a lot of stuff that we are like, no, you're not gonna read that. This this was actually pretty funny. <laughs> okay, and now, right, having gone through in hilarious detail why the diversity part of removal was ridiculous, I want to talk a little bit about the implicating federal law argument, right? Because like. There's a way in which that sounds superficially promising, right? Like, like, mm-hmm. could you say this does implicate federal law because it's really about is the lottery designed to violate the election law? But like, it doesn't matter because that's not what the legal standard is here. You don't get into federal court because left wing commentators think that you're engaged in vote buying, right? The only way you get to federal court on federal law is if A, the lawsuit alleges a violation of federal law, which this doesn't 
or B, it alleges a violation of state law, but that state law requires that you resolve a federal law question first, right? So, for example, if you have a state law that says anyone convicted of a felony will, you know, be debarred from being able to have a contract with the city, and the felony that's alleged is a pending federal felony, right? Like, that's a situation where it necessarily implicates federal law. But that's not the case here. That's not close to the case here, right? Like, it does not matter why Elon Musk is giving away the million bucks to determine that giving away a million bucks violates the Pennsylvania state lottery laws. You don't have to resolve any federal issues. Right. So the federal court ordered Musk to respond to this, you know, emergency remand motion by 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. So perhaps by the time you're listening to this, we will know if this case is going to get sent back to state court immediately. At which point, I don't know, maybe there'll be time for Judge Foglietta to stop a day or two of Musk's lottery before the election. I kind of think the horse is out of the barn on that one. I, it could be. I guess I just I want to end sort of with two things, right? The first is, in the introductory paragraph, D.A. Krasner says, there is no reasonable basis for this removal. Right? That's really strong language. And that's supported by a citation to a Third Circuit case called League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And the parenthetical is, no abuse of discretion for award of costs and fees where removal lacks objectively reasonable basis. So that's not a motion for sanctions at this point, but that's saying, hey, we might move for sanctions at, at some point. And the reason you don't move for sanctions now is because you want to remand this back immediately, you know, get into state court. But a district attorney does not use that level of rhetoric unless they're a, a hack or they're very, very confident of their position. Yeah. I think it's the latter one here, right? And the second is that the removal here went to U.S. District Court Judge Jerry Pappert. Uh, he's a Republican, but he's an Obama appointee Republican. And, and and the fact that Judge Pappert ordered a 10 a.m. turnaround, like a 15 hours worth, uh, and no oral argument, I, I think is kind of putting your cards on the table here, right? Like everybody knows. Elon Musk engaged in a stunt to try and run out the clock. And, uh, you know, maybe everybody will try and see if they can get the last few days. Yeah, I, I think that this is a positive sign. And look, I mean, not to agree with Musk, but in some sense, this is a case about the election, right? Like, he broke a law that's mm -hmm. just, you know, the anti-lottery law is just the law. But he did it in an attempt to influence the election. And if uh, Judge Pappert is acting with, um, with expedition here, I read it as the courts this time saying, we are not going to be the venue for your election denying bullshit. And I think, you know, we've talked about Pennsylvania state courts uh, administratively expediting the process kind of in advance saying this is how we're going to handle election challenges. Mm -hmm. And other state courts in swing states have done the same. And so, look, I mean, we just talked about how there was that election challenge in the Bucks County and they immediately ruled and, and that, you know, hand to Trump his big win there. I think that courts are moving faster. I think that they see it coming in a way that they did not see it coming in 2020 because, you know, everything was nuts. And I, I'm sorry that everything is still nuts. But I, I do think if there's a silver lining here, it's that the courts are are moving with a lot of speed and haste to to deal with this and to not have the courts be a place where these these cases can kind of linger and feed a narrative about a stolen election. I agree with you entirely. So uh, keep our fingers crossed and we'll, we should know tomorrow. All right. That is going to do it for us today, you guys. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us. Uh, as I said, my son Joe will be here on the Tuesday show, although I suspect the Supreme Court has more shenanigans, so you may hear from me too. Don't, uh, don't undermine the, the good note we went out on. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm afraid, no, a, I'm I'm afraid you good. might be right. Yeah, and me too. Yeah. I'm feeling good about Tuesday. Just keep the faith. Just, just keep moving. All right. We'll see you guys. Have a lovely weekend. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Ray Zipson Media, LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney-client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenagle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Ray Zipson Media, LLC, all rights reserved.